Okay. And it's just a little before 10. We'll start in about a minute or so. We're still having, this is great. People are signing on. I'm going to get a beverage too. Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> It's nice to see that two of the seven attendees that have signed on so far are my staff. Yay, go team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very good. I have board members as well. So yeah, <laughs> some staff. Good morning, Joyce. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah. There we go. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to our town hall hosted by our local leg legislators, Senator Joanne Janal and Representative Kathy Kim. And Representative Jenny Arndt has a conflict this morning, so unfortunately she will not be able to join us. Today's topic is an update on behavioral health in Larimer County. And we have three expert panelists today. Lori Stolen, who is the Director of Larimer County Behavioral Health Services, Michael Allen, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Summit Stone, and Dr. Leslie Brooks, who is the Chief of Addiction Medicine, Behavioral Health Services Medical Director, and Interim Executive Director at Summit Stone. My name is Beth Jager, and I will be your moderator for the next 60 minutes. As you listen to our panelists' presentations this morning, please think about questions you wish to ask them during our question and answer session later in today's program. If you wish to ask a question, we're gonna be using the Q&A function on Zoom today, not the chat function, but the Q&A button that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Simply click on that, type in your question, hit submit, and we will do our very best to get to as many questions as possible. And we do ask that your questions today relate to our topic, uh, which is behavioral health services in Larimer County. So let's begin with opening remarks from our elected officials. Representative Kiff, would you like to begin? Uh, yes, thank you. And thank you for moderating again for us, um, Beth. We really appreciate you and Vicki coordinating the, the logistics of moderating. That's always very helpful. And um, thank you to our guests for all um, being here today. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about what's going on in Larimer County on mental health. Um, a quick note, um, just so you know, ballots were mailed out yesterday, so I hope everybody here is planning to vote. Um, I know Representative Arndt this morning is um, had a conflict because she is doing a ballot issues forum in somebody's driveway, um, but um, I just also wanted to make sure that since you're here with us, you're not in that driveway, so you're welcome to join uh, Senator Janal and I tomorrow afternoon from 3.30 to 5 for another ballot issues forum. You know, we just want to make sure everybody has all the information they need before they can vote, especially with everybody wanting to vote as early as possible. So um, anyway, thank you for being here today. Thank you for your interest in behavioral health, and on with the show. Great. Senator Janal? Uh, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, thanks to our speakers today. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this really important topic. Um, just so I, I don't know if anybody realizes this, and maybe our three panelists do, but it's just coincidental that today is International Mental Health Day. Um, and, um, you know, we have had a rough year. It's been a tough one. Uh, on um, people living with mental illness and their caregivers. And um, it's been researched and shown that um, nearly 80% of people living with mental health say that COVID-19 and um, the response to it has made some of their uh, mental health services and just their, their overall health um, uh, because of that, just a little bit worse, uh, a little bit harder to deal with. And so I'm really happy we're having this update uh, from our three expert panelists today on what uh, you know, behavioral health is like looking like in Larimer County at this point in time. But um, I just wanted to mention that. I don't believe any of us plan that. I happened to hear it on the news this morning uh, or yesterday morning. So it's quite timely and I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion and hopefully people will have a lot of questions in regards to um, 
uh, mental health in Lamar County. And the floor is yours. Great. Yeah, it's now my pleasure to introduce our three panelists. Lori Stolen is currently the Behavioral Health Services Director for Larimer County, overseeing the 2018 voter approved sales tax dedicated to expanding and enhancing behavioral health care in Larimer County. Lori has been with Larimer County for 22 years. She was the director of the Larimer County Alternative Sentencing Department from 2010 to 2016 and worked for the Larimer County Sheriff's Office Jail Division for 12 years prior to that. Lori holds a bachelor's degree in human development and family studies from Colorado State University and a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling from the University of Northern Colorado. Michael Allen serves as chief executive officer at Summit Stone and has more than 20 years of experience in behavioral health both as a clinician and as an administrator. In addition to being a licensed clinical social worker and holding his Colorado Certified Addiction Counselor Level 3 certification, Michael also earned an MBA from Colorado State University. He joined Summit Stone Health Partners after serving as Vice President at Aspen Point in Colorado Springs, where he worked for more than a decade. Dr. Leslie Brooks serves as the Chief of Addiction Medicine for Summit Stone Health Partners. As the Chief of Addiction Medicine and Behavioral Health Services Medical Director, Interim Executive Director, Dr. Brooks leads the, the design, development, and implementation of Larimer County's Behavioral Health Services Facility, which is set to be open in 2022. Dr. Brooks has developed expertise in addiction medicine and medication assisted treatment and has traveled around our state educating her colleagues on safe opioid prescribing and substance use disorder. Dr. Brooks, a board certified family physician, practiced full scope family medicine, including prenatal care, obstetrics, chronic pain and substance use disorder and addiction at Sunrise Community Health for nine years before joining Summit Stone. Thank you all for being here this morning. We appreciate your willingness to share your expertise. And Lori, may I ask you to begin? Thank you, Beth. Yes, it's an honor to be here. And I just so appreciate the opportunity to share with our attendees today um, a little bit about behavioral health services since it was a, uh, a voter approved tax initiative that was passed in 2018. It's always wonderful to share back how the dollars are being spent and what we've been doing so creatively with these dollars to expand and enhance behavioral health in Larimer County. So I do have a PowerPoint that I'd like to share this morning. So I'm going to attempt to bring that up if I can and, and hopefully that won't go too difficult. It won't be too difficult. Can everyone see this? Yes. Awesome. And can you just see the PowerPoint, nothing else? Yes, we see the opening slide and your next slide. Seeing the presenter, do you, okay. Lori? Okay. There you go. Thank you, appreciate it. So, just to go back a little bit, I wanted to talk about um, where we've been since 2009, uh, 2018, since the initiative passed. Um, 2019 was our first year, and we were, were quick to put the dollars to work um, in creating a, a Department of Behavioral Health Services here in Larimer County. And so we, we created a, a vision and a mission that we hope will take us into the future, knowing that this is a 20-year sales tax. Um, we've got a, quite a bit of work to do over the 20 years. And so our vision ultimately is to become a county, a community that values and promotes behavioral health and that we ultimately have a comprehensive and sustainable continuum of behavioral health care. So this is a display that we have used for the past year and a half and we think that it's just a good example or good visual of the oversight and, and the funding pathways that are used 
uh, with the revenues that come in um, from the sales tax each month. With the Board of County Commissioners are the fiscally responsible party, so they make decisions on how the money is spent, um, and it includes the guardrails of the ballot language that we have. And ultimately, the goal of these dollars is to increase awareness and access to appropriate and affordable behavioral health care in our community. We have a really robust website that we're so happy to have a, a dedicated staff person. Jennifer Wolf Kimball is our communication and media specialist, and she keeps our website updated with all kinds of information. So anytime you're curious or want to know about what's going on with the behavioral health services dollars in any of these three funding pathways, you can go to larimer.org forward slash behavioral health and look through the website. So I'm gonna go into just a few minutes um, here quickly about the three funding pathways and the oversight of our impact fund, which is our grant program. And then I'll end my presentation with just a few slides of our facility that's in the middle of design and hoping to break ground and start construction in December of this year. So we'll start off with our impact fund. This is a grant program that in 2019, the county commissioners allocated a million dollars of the revenues that come in towards grants. And so we distributed 29 different grants last year to the community and to different agencies that provide uh, behavioral health services to our community. This year, the commissioners allocated $2.5 million. And I tell you what, that was a heavy lift. $2.5 million is a lot of money to spend um, in, in behavioral health. And so we had over 65 different grant applications that were submitted, and we were able to fund 34 different grant applications this year with the $2.5 million that we had to distribute. We are in the process of distributing those funds as we speak. The impact fund itself has three different uh, boards, and they are county commissioner appointed boards that have oversight of these funds. The first one is a behavioral health policy council and that is a 15 member board. And it is made up of a uh, commissioner liaison. Commissioner Steve Johnson is the liaison to that board. We have six at large members and we have eight elected officials, very purposefully selected um, elected officials from each of the eight incorporated municipalities around Larimer County. So we have either a mayor or a town board member or elected town council member that sits on this policy council and our intentions with that policy council are that we really look at geographic diversity of the distribution of dollars, that we are sure that we are attending to our underrepresented populations, and that we really are reaching out into our rural, our agricultural areas, and looking at ways to make behavioral health care appropriate, affordable, and accessible to all. So since that is a board of um, decision-making um, voter uh, approving council members, we have a technical advisory committee that informs them that are the subject matter experts in our community that help make some funding decisions each year of where our most critical gaps are, where we can get the biggest return on investment for our dollars in creating funding pathways that we take to the uh, policy council each year. And then uh, they approve those funding priorities and we create a grant program around those fundable concepts, if you will, each year. And so we use the data that we are receiving to help inform us on where the gaps are, where our most critical needs are in our community. And then we attempt to make those funding partnerships in the, in the community. I'm really excited to share that uh, we are this year creating um, an additional committee that will inform our policy council members. This new committee will be a consumer advisory committee we wanted the voice of people with lived experience and consumers from our community that have experienced both the successes and failures of our systems and their journey um, with either mental health or substance use challenges. And so we are excited to have uh, those voices around the table to also help inform where we can improve services in our community. The next funding pathway that we have is our bridge fund. And I'm gonna move to the next slide here and talk a little bit about um, the bridge fund. It is intended to reduce barriers that people encounter when they are attempting to receive care. And our goal with this bridge fund is to make sure that there's appropriate care coordination, that people that have financial barriers, that we can assist with co-pays and deductibles, 
that if transportation is an issue, getting them to the right level of care, um, medication assisted treatment, certainly appropriate level of care for many people that are struggling with substance misuse in our community. We also look as this is an opportunity to work with partners in our community for permanent supportive housing. Uh, we know that there is great uh, research and, and data available that suggests that when we combine housing and case management care coordination, that we get the best outcomes for people that have that level of need. And interestingly enough, when we started talking about this bridge fund, we really felt that telehealth was something that needed to be ramped up, that we needed to improve access to all around our community. And I guess you could call it one of the collateral beauties of this COVID pandemic is that telehealth services actually have increased in our community. And, and Michael and Leslie could certainly talk about how quickly Summit Stone was able to ramp up to uh, you know, nearly 100% telehealth within days when COVID hit and we had to do this social distancing thing. So I know that uh, providers all around the county have increased their telehealth services. So maybe this isn't something that we need to um, pay attention to as far as funding of this bridge fund because it's already been uh, built out in our community. Lastly, uh, what I wanted to talk to you uh, all about today, just for a few minutes here, is uh, the facility. The crisis services facility that was a significant component of the tax initiative that passed. Uh, we are looking at building a 58,000 square foot building that will have 64 beds in it out at the uh, corner of Taft Hill and Trilby Roads. Uh, we are just finishing up design development and getting ready to um, jump into the construction phase of this project. So we have um, defined the levels of service that will be in this facility and they include uh, behavior health triage, social and medical detox, crisis stabilization, and an intensive residential treatment program that currently in our community, whether you know it or not, the only place that you can get IRT as of right now is through community corrections, which means that we actually are having to criminalize people in order to get that level of care. There will also be a thorough assessment component to this new facility and making sure that we are identif <clears throat> excuse me, identifying all of the needs that someone has and making sure that we can wrap around the right care coordination and assure the maximum levels of outcome and success when they come to get services in this facility. We are excited to be able to also provide pharmacy and lab services in this facility. Our goal is to try to reduce the number of trips to different locations that people in need have. And so if we were able to provide some of these um, levels of care in this facility, um, we're, we're hoping that we can have a more coordinated and seamless um, system of care for them. We are very proud to be partnering with Summit Stone Health Partners and UC Health as the providers of services in this new facility. And we look forward to a long future of success and building out this continuum of care in our community with them as partners around the table. So we meet on a regular basis and, and we're gonna figure out how to do this new thing in our community um, and be able to successfully provide these levels of service. Some of them aren't even available in our community right now. We are unfortunately still having to send many folks in need out of our community, oftentimes down to Denver to Colorado Springs 35 miles to the east, North Range Behavioral Health. And so to bring these services within Larimer County, we think is going to be one of the, the best things that we can do for folks in ensuring that they get the levels of care that they need. I actually have a few pictures that I wanted to show about the facility. I think it's exciting to kind of see where we've come from and, and where we are. And so there was a tremendous amount of intention in the design of this facility when we were looking at where we would locate it, what the benefits were of, of having it on this 40 acre piece of land, the, the connection to, to nature and to open space, uh, we really are gonna take advantage of, of every bit of that with a focus on the view of the mountains, um, with the idea and this concept of transitioning from sickness to wellness, coming in the front doors and going towards this outdoor respite and towards calming. Uh, we have located the building and, and sit it on the on the piece of land so you have these beautiful views that I'll show you a few, a few picture of here real quickly. Um, ultimately, the goals of this overall design obviously are to be sustainable, um, to be warm and relaxing. And you know we have brought in our partners with Summit Stone and UC Health from the beginning of this design to make sure that it truly functions the way that it needs to. So having the input of the end users 
has been very informative to make sure that we get a building that does what we need it to do for the life of the building. I and mean, as, a, as a county building, um, we want this building to last for 40 or 50 years. And so it, we've really gained a lot from having the, the design informed by the end users. We have defined guiding principles for this facility, making sure that it's a welcoming place, that it's safe and secure, that it's recovery oriented, that it engages patients in self-healing, um, that we have supportive staff that are there to make sure that we're fostering healthy relationships and healthy behaviors. And that of course, that this facility can adapt over time to the community needs as they change through the years. We want this facility to be a place of healing. And this is actually standing on the 40 acre site, looking to the west with a view shed um, that, that we will have um, when, when you are outside. We plan to have walking trails and ultimately this to become a campus of community wellness. We want there to be um, services there, um, primary care, dental vision, possibly looking at partnerships in the future to have additional permanent supportive housing on this campus. Uh, we would love to see equine assisted therapy. You know, we, we want to be creative and open and create this to be a, a campus that people from all around our county would feel comfortable in coming to get the services that they need. So quickly, just a few more pictures to let people see the view shed with the sunset. Um, these are some renderings that we have of the site. Um, we want it to be obviously a place of caring. This is a rendering of outside of the building and you can see again how the, the facility is situated on the property. So we've got the parking up front in a, in a circle drive. Um, we do have uh, emergency access. We've been in close partnership with our law enforcement and first responders to make sure that they have a drop off location um, that it is easy for them to access and that we can have um, a place for them to come in and if they need to um, do some of their computer work or they need a lounge, they need a restroom, they need a place to be able to um, rejuvenate themselves in the middle of one of their, uh, their uh, shifts that they can come into this facility and um, have some space to do that as well. Um, another facility picture that we have here is from the back of the facility and you can see that we've got a little amphitheater area. We, um, the, these circles, we're going to have like some walking paths and some group spaces out back where we've got um, some green area and hopefully that will all connect to the walking trails that we'll have into nature. And then quickly to end my presentation here today, I wanted to share just a little bit about the idea of the interior of the facility. Our goal is to try to blend this facility into nature itself. And so we're using a very natural palette. Um, and you can see some of the sample uh, interior design photos that we're using to make this be a place that feels comfortable for all to come in and get care. This is a rendering of when you walk into the front uh, lobby. And as you can see on the second floor up there, there's a lot of glass. That is actually a conference room. That will be a community resource. It will be a conference room large enough for the community to come in and do trainings, to do conferences. Um, and we want this to be a, a community facility. And so that will be schedulable for, um, for use by the community. And we would welcome people to come in and, and use that space and learn more about the services that are provided in the facility. And lastly, I've got a picture here of just um, the, what one of the, the bedrooms may look like with the views connected to outside. Our goal is to make this feel um, residential and safe and warm and welcoming. And we'll obviously have all of the security components in the, in the building, but our intention is to sort of hide that hardness behind the softness and the features that make it feel safe and warm for people to recover when they come in this facility. So again, I wanna remind everyone that we do have um, updates on our website at larimer.org forward slash behavioral health. Um, as we continue to move forward with the design and the construction of this facility, we're going to have a drone flyover, regular, um, probably on a, a weekly cadence, and they will take updated pictures of the construction as it's going on, and then we'll be able to show those updates on our website. So we would encourage people to reach out to us if you have questions about anything and to go to our website um, to, to keep updated on all that's going on. 
With that, I would love to hand it over to Michael Allen to take it over from here. Great, thank you, Lori, appreciate that. Great presentation and um, so appreciate your leadership where I get asked a lot from uh, different areas when I travel around, how are you doing what you're doing in Larimer County? And I say, first, get yourself a, Lar a Lori Stolen and then from there you can make things happen. And so, you know, we'd love to put you in the copier and replicate you. And thanks to our legislators as well for hosting this and allowing us to have this platform and some time to talk about some exciting things. I could be prouder to be a resident um, and employer in Larimer County. Some amazing things are happening all over in Larimer County, but specifically in the behavioral health field around mental health and addiction services. Um, I couldn't start the conversation without talking about COVID. Obviously we started talking about that. COVID has impacted every part of our life, um, how we go to school, how we socialize, how we work, uh, how we obtain health care, um, just everything. I mean, how we have, how we have forums uh, has all changed as well, how we do these town halls. So uh, COVID certainly has impacted our world as well. Um, as um, at the Community Mental Health Center for Larimer County, um, you know, we, uh, we see 10,000 patients a year. We have 380 employees. We have eight um, buildings that are Summit Stone and we're in 26 other locations in our area. Uh, so that's not a small footprint. And so you can imagine how a global pandemic would affect services for our folks who really, really need our care. Um, and so we actually made the decision in early March to pivot to a largely uh, telehealth model for much of our outpatient services. And so we actually, like Lori said, made the decision on a Friday that we were gonna do this. By the next Wednesday, we were 80% virtual. And by that next Friday, within a week, we were 100% uh, virtual on outpatient services. So um, one thing we've learned from this is uh, we can do hard things really, really fast and we can pivot when needed. And um, I'm just so grateful for the technology to be able to do this um, because I, I don't even wanna think about how, what would have happened if we weren't able to reach out to folks. And it's been a real blessing to be able to have a phone and televideo and other options for folks who need them. Uh, so really quickly, um, I guess Summit Stone's always been open. Uh, we've never closed. Um, I know that healthcare is an essential service and sometimes mental and addiction services and mental health and addiction services are not included. They are in my mind. I think we need to reattach the head to the body and treat the whole person. And so mental health and addiction services are essential healthcare services. And as an essential service provider, we never closed. Uh, we've been open this whole time. Uh, our main phone number is, is operational. We have been seeing and admitting new clients uh, every day um, and, and treating them in the best way that we can. Um, we also, and I'll talk a little bit about other crisis services, our essential community services have been open. Um, we kept two of our buildings open that contain pharmacies. Uh, so folks that uh, we have one in Fort Collins and one in Loveland that remains open and, and has remained open. Uh, we're still providing all our long acting injectables, pharmacy services, some individual counseling with protections. And then we still, you know, we're so community-based, right? Community is in our name as a community mental health center that we still have our folks meeting folks where they're at in the community. There are many folks who would never come into a waiting room and that is perfectly fine. We will go to them and, and seek them out and find them and those services have never stopped. We have lots of partner agencies that we continue to work with as well. So has COVID impacted our work? Yes. Um, um, but um, we've still been able to be there for our community and, um, and meet the need as much as we could uh, in a different way. Uh, I wanted to let you know also that crisis services are still available and operational. We have three uh, methods of crisis services in our area locally. Uh, we have our behavioral, behavioral health urgent care, uh, which is uh, 1217 Riverside, which is our walk-in uh, clinic that remains open uh, for all ages, um, regardless of payer. So uh, that remains open and can, is, is still operational. Uh, we still operate mobile crisis 24-7, 365. We'll come to you. We have a team and transportation and we'll come to you if needed. Uh, so you don't have to come to us, we can get to you as well. And then we ha still have operational our crisis stabilization unit, which is at the same location, 1217 Riverside, um, which we have capacity for 10, um, but we've actually reduced it to eight um, because we had two double rooms. And so due to COVID, we didn't want to have folks share rooms. Um, and so we actually have capacity of eight and uh, that is adults only uh, up to five day stay. And so that is still available for our community as well. So I really, I just want to do some um, myth busting, I guess, education, just kind of outreach and, and let you know that we're still here and we're, we're here for our community in crisis. 
and um, and um, that uh, services are still being operational. So I know that um, I'm looking at our data that the numbers have uh, they decreased in March, April, May, but they're starting to come back up. I know that a lot of folks just kind of white knuckled and, and hung on through COVID initially, and um, it is it is safe to ask for help and it's safe to reach out and it's safe uh, and we can we can help you out. So. Uh, we'll provide some resources for reaching out, but just want to let you know that we're here and available for you. Uh, we also have our uh, law enforcement uh, co-responder program where we do paired response with a mental health clinician and um, police and uh, emergency personnel first responders. And they have continued to respond throughout this uh, crisis as well. And our co-responders have been doing amazing work. So lots of resources in our community. Uh, so I guess if you hear one thing from my presentation is please ask for help please reach out, no question too small. Uh, we're here for you in our community. Um, let's see, what else I wanna say? I think I want to talk a little bit about, um, talk a little bit about crisis um, and, and, and maybe you're not in crisis and maybe you just wanna talk and maybe you're, you're not sure, you know? I mean, I just, I'm feeling a little, I don't know, disrupted, dysregulated. Maybe, you know, I'm struggling with kids at home. I'm struggling with the work from home. I haven't been out in a while. I just need to talk to somebody, but I'm not in crisis. There's help for you too. Um, we have actually partnered with the Health District of Northern Colorado and using their connections line. That is now expanded to be 24 seven, 365, staffed by folks. It's a phone line and it's not a crisis line. It is an emotional support line. Um, this is for folks who, it's not a therapy line. You know, you may not need therapy. You don't need crisis. It, it may not even be a mental health issue, but it's an emotional support line around COVID specifically. This is actually funded through uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management um, Administration, through Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Uh, Summit Stone received a grant uh, to stand this up. And rather to add one more line, rather than add one more phone line for folks to remember, we just used and partnered with the Health District's uh, Connections line, which is 970-221. 5551. Uh, I can put that in chat when I'm when I can multitask a little bit better, but 970-221-5551. I also have a brochure that I can send out to Beth who could send to all of you who are on this call. Um, but really, this is staffed by folks who are really good listeners. They are really good resources and they can help you out uh, if you just want to talk and if you need resources, we can get you that. So you don't have to wait till it's a crisis. Please uh, talk to somebody, call somebody. And just, we're here for you uh, if you just wanna chat. We also provide uh, community-based outreach through this grant as well. So we'll go to employers and schools and other groups like Rotary and just talk about this resource as well. I think the way to eliminate stigma and the, is to normalize it and talk about mental health and addiction issues because guess what, they're, they're health issues. If I were to ask you, raise your hand if you have diabetes, raise your hand if you have high blood pressure, why wouldn't you say raise your hand if you have depression? That's just the same. So, you know, it's, um, we need to eliminate the stigma by talking in normal terms. And these are things that we're all going through and normalizing it. If we can name it, we can talk about it like Mr. Rogers says, he's one of my heroes. Um, and then we have an educational piece as well. And so, um, uh, so there's a lot of, as part of this, but again, that phone number 24 seven, 365, please reach out. Don't have to be in crisis. And um, we'd love to talk to you. I wanna also talk to you about, um, Lori had a wonderful presentation about um, our BHS uh, facility opening in 2022. Um, related to that, Summit Stone actually has a, a building um, a facility and a new program opening up in the next few months. Uh, it's called uh, Garcia House, a circle, a circle program by Summit Stone. Um, and uh, you may have heard of circle programs. They started out in the state hospital in Pueblo many, many years ago. Um, and they're for folks with co-occurring mental health and addiction issues. And these are really for uh, folks who have complex needs um, and pretty serious issues. Uh, the step up from this is really hospitalization. So um, this is really a pretty high level of care. Um, we are opening a 16 bed facility, eight men, eight women, um, and it'll open in the next few months. Uh, we're calling it Garcia House, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, it's a two-story, approximately 13,000 square foot um, building. It will be for folks over age 18. Um, so uh, um, it'll be, again, 16 bed, 24 seven, um, average length of stay about 90 days. The real, the primary function of this is really to stabilize folks who have co-occurring substance use and mental health disorders 
to a point where they can uh, be successful in a less restrictive level of care and step down maybe to intensive outpatient or something more in the community. Really, it's about stabilization. Some folks leave this, need this uh, longer term than others. Um, and um, I tell you more about this, but I'm teasing you a little bit because we actually, our fundraiser at the end of this month for Summit Stone on October 28th from noon to one, we're actually gonna do a virtual walkthrough and really, and show renderings and pictures of this and we're gonna do a, a history of um, Fred Garcia, who we're naming this after. Uh, Fred Garcia uh, has been a longtime board member of Summit Stone, a uh, national advocate for substance use services, and really a champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so we're very proud to name this after uh, Fred Garcia and call this Garcia House. So I'm not gonna spoil all that right now, just a little teaser that that's coming, but it's really a coup. There's only three circle programs in the state. There's one in Pueblo, there's one in Grand Junction, and there's one in Fort Collins, uh, will be one in Fort Collins. So uh, funded through um, Office of Behavioral Health uh, funding and um, other, other payers, but we can get into more of that soon, but it's a real coup for our community to have this. It's a statewide program. We'll take referrals from across the state, but um, I think this is really, as part of our continuum of substance use services for adults, I mean, in addition to what Lori just talked about, this is really amazing for Larimer County to have this in our backyard. I mean, wow, this is, I hope you're proud of that. I am very proud of, of what our community has been able to do. Um, I think that's what I want to talk about today. So I think I've gone over my time. So <laughs> happy to take any questions. Uh, and I could talk about this all day long because I get excited about it. So thank you for the time. I'd love to turn uh, some time over to Dr. Leslie Brooks. Thank you. I thank you so much for having me. I will, I will, I will just try and place um, a little coda on what Lori and Michael have so um, expertly and eloquently talked about. Lori, thank you so much for your leadership on, on, on BHS. Um, to Representative Kipp and Senator Denal, thank you so much for hosting this and for, and for having us today. Um, Michael, thank you for hiring me and for your leadership at, um, at Summit Stone. Um, and thank everyone for joining us. I, I, won't, I won't take up too much time because I, I hope uh, and expect that there may be lots of questions and I wanna uh, leave plenty of time for that. Um, but what I, what I do wanna highlight is um, the way in which Summit Stone has shown up and turned up for addiction services in our community. Michael mentioned that we have split the head from the body in our healthcare world and we absolutely have done that. We have centers for mental health and behavioral health and we have centers for physical health. And, and, and we, are, we are doing incredible work to bring those two things together um, again. But, but, but under, uh, in addition to that, we have also split the head in half um, because the way that we fund mental health and the way that we fund addiction are often two different things. And Summit Stone has absolutely recognized that that is challenging and problematic. And we represent a way to treat, to bring both of those things under one roof and to treat them um, as, though the, as though they arise from the same organ and they, and they do, and they do. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight some of the ways in which um, uh, Summit Stone has um, really, really uh, put a focus on, on, on an area that is often over, overlooked, which is addiction services. Um, Michael talked about Garcia House, Lori talked about BHS, Summit Stone could not be more proud to be involved in both of those things. And they both represent an absolutely new direction and, 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 and innovation in the space of addiction services. BHS will offer um, services for addiction under one roof that just does not exist in our region, in our state, uh, in, in, in the region um, uh, around us. Um, Garcia House and the Circle Program are just incredible. Um, that Lori mentioned that typically one needs to be criminalized. One needs to be involved with the criminal justice system in order to uh, receive this level of care. Um, and this Garcia House will be an opportunity to receive this level of care uh, with, without that. And we have plenty of people in our communities um, uh, who need this level of care who are not involved in the criminal justice um, system. Uh, Summit Stone understands the intersectionality of so many spaces that addiction lives, um, the intersectionality of children and families, the intersectionality of working individuals who may have substance use disorder, the intersectionality of criminal justice, um, uh, obviously. 
uh, and we have the expertise to bring all of those things um, together. So, Summit Stone partners um, like There's No Tomorrow. We are an incredible partner. We have partnered with the county. We have partnered with Sunrise Community Health, with Salute Health Partners, with Physical Health, with, with, with our Department of Health Services, with Child and Family Services. Um, we, we bring those, those partners together and we bring folks to the table um, to say, we, may, we may not be the experts in this, but we understand how to bring folks together um, so that we can serve people um, wholeheartedly. Um, and lastly, I just want to I just want to mention um, that and recognize that Sunri that Summit Stone also recognizes the larger conversation that our country is having right now around structural inequity and structural racism. Um, and we understand that in many ways, um, these inequities have left folks with mental health and substance use issues uh, feeling unseen and unheard. Um, and we recognize the importance um, of these issues and how they and how they interact. Um, uh, to, to wreak havoc sometimes on, on, on our mental health and, 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 and the impact that they have had on folks with, a substance, with substance use disorders. Um, we are committed at the highest level of our organization uh, to addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion, race, privilege, and power in our organization, and how that allows us to show up for our community. Um, we recognize that it is possible that many in our community may not have seen themselves as, as, as represented at Summit Stone, as being a place where they could come uh, and, and, and get help. Um, and we wanna say today, every day and moving forward, um, that we are working to change that. That we are working to make sure that every facet of our community knows that they can get service here, that they are welcome here, that we see them and we hear them. And so I will stop with, with that because I, I, I hope that we have lots and lots of questions. So thanks so much for having me, I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brooks, Michael, Lori. Fascinating information, very helpful information. I wanna um, just remind all of our attendees, if you wish to ask a question, just do it through the uh, Q&A function and we'll get to as many uh, of your questions as possible. To begin, here there is a question that you all have touched on but it's about how COVID-19 has impacted demand for services, but not only COVID-19, but current events in our country, the violence in our country, the upcoming election. Can one of you or all of you speak to that? You, uh, sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you. Start with you, yeah. I'm sorry, Beth, you, you cut out just a little bit for me. Can you say that, can you say that last piece again? Um, yes, it's, it's about how the, uh, the demand for services have been impacted by COVID-19, the violence in our country, the upcoming election, all sorts of current events. A a absolutely, we 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 at Summit Stone, and I know and I know that uh, the the county does um, uh, as well through their uh, long term rec COVID recovery efforts are recognizing um, the larger conversation that our country is having is having at this time around uh, structural racism, um, structural inequality, and and how that has impacted people and some of the poor health outcomes that we are seeing in our community. We also recognize that the current pandemic um, and its resultant economic devastation in many of our, in, across the country and in many of our communities, the antidote for COVID-19 and the social distancing and the, and, uh, and the resultant isolation that we feel is absolutely uh, uh, an antecedent for worsening mental health conditions, worsening substance use conditions, because that isolation um, puts people further away from community, which is absolutely part of the treatment um, for, for many of our folks with mental health issues and substance use issues. So we recognize that those things are happening. We also, in, 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 in addressing those things, um, you know, Lori, I'll let you speak to the, to the, to the county's efforts and some of those uh, uh, committees that we are sitting on, um, but Summit Zone recognizes that access has to look different. And so we have doubled down and committed to uh, telehealth and remote services. We don't care that you can't come into our building. We will, we will figure out how to serve you. Um, uh, we want people to call us. We want people to reach out. Um, we have, not only have we offered our individual services via telehealth, we have, we have figured out how to offer some of our group settings 
via telehealth. We recognize that that does not work for every single person. So within COVID-19 restrictions and making sure that people are safe, uh, we are beginning to offer uh, services back in our building um, and really examining what's, what those things look like. And like I said, um, Summit Stone is committed at, every, at the highest level of our organization from our board member throughout our organization to understanding the impacts of structural inequality and racism and looking at our policies and procedures, looking at the way that we show up in our community to make sure that our persons, uh, that our marginalized communities understand that we are here for them and that they can see themselves and, and, and get service here. I'll stop there, Michael, do you wanna? Yeah, just to add a little bit, thank you. Yeah, well said. I mean, I don't know that I need to add anything. What, what I would say is, you know, our staff live here too, right? In this community, we, we know what's going on, right? We live in the, in the world here as well. And so, you know, we know that, you know, not only are we dealing with a global, you know, public health crisis, which created an economic crisis, which we also have a, you know, kind of a race and, and equity crisis. And, um, oh, by the way, you know, we still have an opioid crisis and a suicide, you know, epidemic. So, I mean, there's things going on, right? And, and, and folks are um, scared, uh, feeling lots of things. I think we are going through some grief and loss around, you know, how life used to be. And, you know, I mean, I found myself, I worked on a TV tray in my home office here for four months thinking this was all gonna go away and it was all temporary. You know, I finally bought a big boy desk here that I'm working on now, you know, it's like, okay, this is permanent. I'm gonna get a real desk and be comfortable, right? But I had to go through my own process there too. I was like, no, you know, I'm not buying into this, right? I'm like, okay, this is real, I get it, we're here. And we had to go through this grief and loss process. I think we're going through this, right? And part of the grief and loss process is finding a way through in new and different ways, right? It's it's letting go of some things we did before. And, and so, you know, we're working through, you know, our staff, our clients, you know, our community is going through this process of, of change. And I think humans, you know, we can handle change pretty well. What is really hard on us is uncertainty. And, and because of so much uncertainty that is really wearing on our emotional um, our, our emotions, our emotional health. Um, and so that's why we're putting a lot of things in place around, you know, moving upstream with this, with this emotional support line, right? You don't have to be in crisis to call. You don't have to wait for a diagnosis to come into Summit Stone. Call and talk to us before, right? Um, that's why we're still going out in the community and meeting with folks with protective measures, right? Um, we are doing town halls. We're doing education. We still do you question, persuade, respond. Suicide prevention work is happening virtually, right? We're still doing a lot of our school work through iPads and school supports, right? So, I mean, our work continues in a different way, but I think it's important that we address, don't have to have a diagnosis, right? Uncertainty is really wearing on the soul. Let's talk about that, right? Let's figure out a way forward together as a community. And I think town halls like this are very helpful. So that would be the piece I would add. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, this is from one of our attendees. I am a school psychologist in PSD. With the passage of the ballot issue, I know that many school mental health professionals were optimistic about extended inpatient substance abuse and outpatient options for younger clients beyond what we can provide in the schools. Can one of you speak to the additional services that will be extended to adolescents with the new funds? Sure. Lori, do you wanna take that? I would yeah. be happy to. I turned around and I was looking for um, the spreadsheet that I have that's usually so handy right in front of me of the grant recipients this year so I could just kind of go down the list and inform uh, our uh, participants today of some of the adolescent providers in our community that did receive grant funding. But what can I what I can tell you is is that was the overwhelming um, application pool that we got for grant funds it seems that our entire community is very aware in recognizing the need for increased adolescent care. Uh, the, the number of providers that have come forward and said, if we just had the resources, if we could just grow our capacity, um, we, have, we have the awareness, we have the data, we have the knowledge of, of what it's gonna take, but we just don't have the resources to be able to provide the level of services that kids need. And so I can assure you, and I, I wish I could grab that, um, in my hand. I wish I could have it and, and I'd be able to show you, but I just don't want to waste the time to do it. Um, so many of the funds that we distributed this year go towards uh, uh, increasing adolescent care. 
The second thing I can tell you about adolescent care is that in this behavioral health facility that we're planning on opening, there are levels of service, of course, all governed by licensure and regulations of, of people higher than all of us here, um, even you elected officials. We have to follow the guidelines of OBH and, and CDPHE and right, all of the um, governing licensing bodies that we have, but there will be levels of care in this new behavioral health facility that will be for all ages. Our goal is to be able to, be, to provide crisis care, to come through our behavioral health triage hub, whether you are zero or 100 years old, and we will figure out where's that next best place that you need to go, and that we will help that person or that family get to the right level of care. So there are um, services that will be available for, for kids, for adolescents. This new crisis service facility will, will take you into that behavioral health triage hub, and we will do our very best to the assessment and making the connections and ensuring that right level of care um, is, is in place for uh, the folks that are coming through those services. The other thing I can tell you is as we grow out the multiple phases of this project, um, we get the behavioral health services facility up and running, which I know we're going to do. We're going to get there. We're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel with a groundbreaking this year, and we plan on opening that facility in 2022. The next phase of this project is to build out that campus. And in phase two of that campus build out is adolescent residential services. So to have a place where um, kids that are identified that need more than just a community level of help, we don't have to send kids out of community or even out of state to get the levels of care that they need. So that's, that's a next phase. That, that needs to be addressed and we recognize that. And so it's on our strategic plan to continue to build out those services at the campus. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions here that really pertain to how do you pay for services? Do you need to have Medicaid, Medicare, some type of insurance? And what if you're uninsured? Can you still access services? Michael, do you want to take that? Yeah. We absolutely uh, can serve folks. Yeah, absolutely. So we have indigent funding as well, uh, what's called indigent funding. So, um, so it's actually through the Office of Behavioral Health. Uh, we also um, uh, receive grants for things like that. So certainly, um, you know, one of the first questions we'll ask is, you know, what insurance do you have? And the only reason we ask that is because um, each insurance has different benefit plans. So the, what services and what, you know, programs are available to you depend on your insurance. If you don't have it, then we also have indigent funds for you. So it will not be turned away. Okay, great. Um, we have also a couple of questions about concerns for the homeless. Um, how, will, how will the homeless be able to know about services and access services? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that and then maybe you guys can chime in. So we actually, um, uh, working with people experiencing homelessness is uh, an important part of our work. We actually have a whole team that does that. And we have folks who are on site at Murphy Center uh, for Hope. Uh, I think it's Sister Mary Alice uh, Murphy Center for Hope. I think that's the full name. Uh, we have staff on site there. Uh, we also work with you know, Harvest Farm and we work with... Um, um, uh, what's the one downtown? Anyway, we work with those programs um, and uh, we actually have staff uh, on site all the time. Um, and um, working with people experiencing homelessness is really important. Again, you know, Summit Stone is not in the housing business. We, you know, we're, we're not landlords, but we're very good about helping people apply for housing, uh, get housing and keep their housing. Because just being housed is not the, you know, solving of the problem. You got to keep your housing, right? Because there's you know, rules to follow and, and, and things that, that come with, uh, with um, having a place to live. And so we uh, have a team uh, dedicated to that. In fact, when Aslan Center opened up, you know, temporarily during COVID and, and we had actually two staff there working uh, directly face to face with folks, uh, we have the ability to do telehealth. Uh, we've provided a uh, phone. A lot of our folks who are experiencing homelessness don't have access to technology. We actually have provided phones and iPads for folks. And if they don't want to have them due to, you know, jeopardizing their personal safety through that, we actually keep them with a case manager and they can access those when they need to. So really we've tried to be, and I think we have been very innovative and um, creative in ways to uh, help a very marginalized population access services, um, but certainly open to feedback on ways to do that better, but it is an important part of what we do. 
And, and I think the biggest, the, the the most important, I think, point that 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 should be made here is that homelessness or houselessness is not a barrier to services. I can't tell you the number of times that I see that I see you know medication assisted treatment protocols or other protocols around you know around medications that that talk about um, you know we'll do all of these things. And here's what we'll do for our homeless and houseless population, right? That none of those things are barriers for us to deliver the care that our that our folks need, regardless of how completely they are housed or not housed. Great, thank you. We we have about five minutes left in our program, and I wanted to leave a little time for all of you to give brief closing remarks. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but. Uh, I think people know where to look for those answers now. So with that, may I ask uh, Lori and Michael and Dr. Brooks to give a brief closing remark? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go first and I'll let Lori and, and, and Michael uh, 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 have, the, have the last words. And, I'll, and, and in closing, I'll address um, Senator Janal's question around working with CSU and students studying behavioral health and, and and, and, and psych students. We, Summit Stone couldn't be more excited to be standing in these spaces at this juncture in time. Um, this, is, this is just an incredible time, I think, to be in, to be in healthcare and to be in um, uh, behavioral healthcare. There are nothing but you know, new roads to explore and new avenues to explore. And absolutely, Senator Janal, Senator we anticipate and, and hope that, that we will be a teaching that, that teaching will be a huge part of what we do because there is, there is no question but that we have a lot to learn in how to deliver um, uh, services to, to our behavioral health population um, in new and different ways. Um, so yes, we want to be part of how, how students learn, how existing practitioners re relearn how to do this work, teaching existing practitioners who often say, you know what, that's not really what I do. You know, if I start doing that, then I'll start to get all of these folks in my in my practice, and you know, sort of guess what? They're already in your practice, um, and and how can you serve them uh, uh, where where they are and where you are? So absolutely, we we will we anticipate that teaching um, the next generation and teaching our colleagues how to do this differently um, is part of what we will do. So thank you so much for 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 having us, and I'll I'll, I'll leave it to Michael and Lori to to finish up. But I'll go next. We'll just go backwards, reverse order from how we uh, did our presentation. So thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Um, this was one of the fastest hours of my week, actually. So I would love to talk about this for a, a lot longer. So we'll have to do this again. Uh, looking forward to it. I just want to circle back to something that Senator Janelle said, which is, uh, you know, World Mental Health Day. Um, I just appreciate that so much. I can't think of a a better way to join together in the spirit of well-being and, and care for one another than talking about this on, on World uh, Mental Health Day. So thank you for that. And I guess my only other comment would, would be, um, I wanna take some time to shout out to uh, my staff and actually all behavioral health care staff right now. Um, when you drive you know, around Fort Collins and Loveland and our Larimer County, you'll see lots of signs saying, healthcare heroes work here, healthcare heroes work here. Um, and guess what? They also work in my shop. They work in, you know, in Lori's shop. Um, our, behavioral healthcare our, our behavioral healthcare workers are healthcare heroes. Um, and so I would ask that when you think of healthcare heroes, that you think of our behavioral health folks as well. They are on the front lines every day, working with folks, COVID or not, housed or not, um, emotionally healthy or not, it doesn't matter. Um, we are there in our community every day, working with folks at their most vulnerable time in their lives, when they are feeling um, broken often, when they're struggling and they may not know what to do, um, our community is there for them. And there's lots of behavioral healthcare heroes in our community. So I guess I would just end and say, uh, thank you to our behavioral healthcare heroes, Sunstone and otherwise. Um, you are my heroes and you're doing this every day and I'm just impressed by you every day. So thank you. Lori. Thank you, Beth. Again, I wanted to thank Kathy and, and Joanne for having us here this, today and, and doing this town hall. And I also hope that we get to do it again. Um, I'm excited by the number of questions and the engagement that the community continues to have around this. And I think that our websites are again, are a great place to go to keep updated. 
Um, I want to remind everyone that when we started off this um, tax initiative and this campaign in the community, our promise holds true to be good stewards of these tax dollars, to be transparent and to make sure that we report out to the community on how the dollars are spent. And we make a commitment to doing that. The only way that we'll be successful is through strong and uncommon partnerships in our community. And so some of the questions ask about how will you partner with Turning Point or Mountain Crest? I hope that the partnership that you see that the county has made with Summit Stone and UC Health um, is an example of, we know that the only way to be successful is through collaborative partnerships in our community. Um, we've been asked to, to come to different places around the country. Um, most re recently, I was um, before COVID, I was back in New York City sharing with them how you create these public-private partnerships to be successful in creating some of the um, most creative solutions for some of our biggest challenges that many places around the country have not been able to solve. And I believe it's because we have one, the political will, and two, we have the willingness of our community leaders to come together to solve these difficult problems. So we've promised to not be competitive or redundant in providing services with these dollars, but to be complementary and to truly, truly do the research to find where our most critical gaps are and then to address those through partnerships in our community to have this continuum of care to increase awareness and access to affordable and appropriate behavioral health care. So with that, I would just remind everyone that, you know, partnerships and coming together is the best way to solve problems. And we couldn't be happier to have the, the example of that here today of how the government, how politicians, if you will, how private providers, local government, state government can come together and solve very challenging problems. So with that, I thank everyone again for, for being here today. Thank you so much, Lori. Representative Kipp and Senator Janal, do you have some closing remarks? Uh, yes, just very briefly, thank you, Beth, for moderating. And thanks to you all um, for being our panelists today. You know what? You guys just give me hope. Um, you are just such a wonderful and inspiring part of our community. So um, thank you for all of the work you do. I think you've given us some good resources. If you pass those on to us, we will make sure to share them um, with our community. And we'll be, I think we're recording this so we will have it um, online and accessible to folks, um, hopefully very shortly. And um, I guess one more thing, um, one of the reasons we got to the point that we're at is because people like you take the time to vote in elections. Um, ballots, as I mentioned at the beginning, are on their way. Um, if you go to kathykip.com, my website, Kathy with a C, Kip with a K, you can see the schedule of uh, many of our events. But as I said, we have another one tomorrow where Joanne and I will be talking ballot issues and I'll have a driveway event tomorrow. Every time you, know, you talk to us, uh, we just want to make sure you're well informed to make those decisions. So um, anyway, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for all you do for our community. And thanks to everybody who um, logged in to watch to take the time to come today because this is a great panel. Thank you. Senator Jamal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Beth and Vicki for facilitating and getting this technology to work. Uh, thank you to our three panelists who I've worked for uh, and with, not for, but with, um, and hope hope to work with you in the coming years. Uh, you are, I think, Michael, you brought up healthcare heroes, and it just, it, 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 it's really important that we recognize behavioral health heroes just as much as we do physical health um, uh, heroes. So thank you for bringing that uh, to our attention, because you three are our Larimer County heroes, along with many other people, but behavioral health has been left out of that equation. And now it's not going to be. Um, I want, want to thank you, uh, Lori, for the inside look at our new facility. I think it, it's going to be awesome and that we are going to get a lot of people that need the help that they need. Um, and it's just something I think our tax dollars are well, our tax money is well spent on. Um, Michael, thank you for talking about telehealth um, and how that how virtual uh, we, we did become to 100% virtual is actually awesome. And I believe it's probably helping a lot of folks as well. And I want to thank all of you because I know I've called on you, especially during uh, the stay at home uh, 
uh, part of COVID, I think it was um, March, April, and May, I had several constituents that were really stressed. Uh, they were in need of medications. Uh, they were in need of, uh, of mental health uh, help. And um, you came to my rescue. Uh, I, call, I called you and um, we went through various pathways, but we got those constituents and those people who were just totally stressed out, had nowhere else to go. You found a pathway forward. Michael, uh, Dr. Brooks, I can't thank you enough. I know those folks uh, are, are, are thanking you as well, but you saved people's lives. And um, I can't tell you how important this uh, this town hall is, I look at the number of participants on here and it's, it's extremely high. And, um, you know, that just shows the importance and the interest that people have in behavioral health and their, their needs and getting their needs met. We have about eight more uh, Q and A's and I hope that we'll be able to uh, reach out and get that information and those questions answered. But I just want to thank you all uh, you help so many people and this is a tough time and um, we need your help now more than ever. So thank you all. And I just wanna echo my thanks. I wanna thank all the attendees for participating today and each and every one of the panelists for the incredible work you do in service of our community. So thank you very much. Thank you for your comments today and hope that everybody has a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye now.